On the phone, it is a pleasure to welcome to the program professor of political science at University of Maryland, author of Whistling Past Dixie, which remains, a, uh, I think, a, a controversial book, uh, one which I uh, enjoyed incredibly, uh, and author of the latest, The Stronghold, How Republicans Captured Congress But Surrendered the White House. And this, uh, uh, Tom, uh, welcome to the program. Great to be here. Thanks, Tim. So, uh, Tom, I mean, I love the—what uh, I what I really appreciate about your book is that this is a dynamic that I think um, is, you know, I, it seems to me in so much of our political analysis, this dynamic seems to be overlooked as if the—I the, mean, you capture here in this book, and, and, and what I also love about it is sort of like a history of—, of uh, this is a deep history of our politics over the past uh, 25 years, I guess. Uh, yep. And But you capture a dynamic that I think uh, most people sort of, uh, of miss as they analyze politics, which is that there's a different set of incentives that are working for uh, when you talk to people, uh, to uh, Republicans who are in Congress, versus sort of some ethereal notion of the Republican Party. That's right. I mean, I started out writing this book, as I mentioned, the acknowledgments. I was just sort of going to write a book about the Republican Party in the post-Reagan era, and I was going to look at the two Bush presidencies. This book ended, ends to that period, with the first Bush being sort of a, an apostate being too liberal, and then some argued Bush 43 being too conservative, and both of them destroying Reagan's legacy, but perhaps from different ideological sort of fronts. And as I started writing the book, I was interviewing three people. I was interviewing Christine Todd Whitman, um, former sort of moderate New Jersey governor, and uh, Ed Gillespie, who's Mr. Republican Insider, and then Grover Norquist, sort of as sort of the person from the from the from the base of the party and the interest group angle of the party and the money side of the party. And I started talking to them about what happened in the early 90s after Clinton won, and then they turned around two years later and won the Congress. And it became clear to me that they were very excited about having captured the Congress, which of course she would be. But not only that, but that they 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 sort of preferred or cherished the Congress even more than, than Dole's campaign. And we started talking about Dole's campaign, and I realized I was writing the wrong book. I realized that the book I needed to write was this argument about, in our era of divided government, which will be 44 of the last 64 years by the time Obama leaves office in January 2017 two-thirds of the time, 70 percent of the time, that Republicans are actually, obviously both parties would like to have everything in Washington, but if you had to pick, Republicans should prefer the Congress over the presidency despite the era of dominance of Eisenhower, Nixon, Ford, and Reagan, Bush 41, um, and their notion that they are sort of the foreign policy party and all that stuff, because their philosophical approach to government, Sam, is to slow, to thwart, to dilute, to, to block, to obfuscate, to you know, a hostage crisis, the debt ceiling, and you can do that better from Congress. And so all else equal, uh, if they can't have the whole thing, they'd rather have the Congress, and more specifically the House, where you can really choke off the entirety of the national government, which for the last four years they were, for the most part, able to do. Yeah, I mean, uh, Norquist told you uh, in your book that, um, uh, I guess, so uh, as you, that, that, that you can govern from the House, which is ironic, too, because on some level, uh, Norquist is... Um, uh, whole philosophy, like you say, is is to have as little governing as possible. And Norquist is a really interesting figure because Norquist was, uh, in many respects, uh, to, in my mind at least, what sort of the precursor to the Tea Party, if not, uh, you know, and I'm not talking, you know, ideologically to the extent that you can make an argument there is ideological, to the extent that there, his attitude of uh, 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 the Club for Growth was one of the the biggest, I guess, groups out there that was uh, attacking Republicans in primaries. He wasn't being he wasn't successful uh, for the most part, as far as I can remember, back in the day. But he was that was a big strategy for him. Yeah, you know, when I was talking to him about Bush 41, he said, you know, that guy, that president, just misunderstood the coalition, and of course, the coalition in the late 80s and early 90s was changing, and so Bush could be, I suppose, forgiven for not understanding the movement that was happening under his feet. I mean, Bush was an old Rockefeller-style Republican, was pro-choice until he had to convert and all this other business, and he was a, a Bob Michael-style accommodation moderate Republican when the Republicans used to have significant seats in the Northeast and the Midwest, and of course, Bush is really a Connecticut Yankee, he's not really a Texas, you know, pork rind, you know, t 
cowboy boot wearing, you know, facade like he put on during the 1988 campaign to win over Dukakis. But the fact of the matter is, was that, you know, Bush did come to the uh, party from a different philosophical approach. They believed, okay, our agenda is different, but ultimately we believe in the basic notion of the federal government as a problem solver, as a place to establish policy. Whereas in the last 25 years, I think the fundamental notion coming in is uh, epitomized by John Boehner's comments a couple of years ago, which is we shouldn't be judged by the laws we pass. We should be judged by the laws we repeal. This notion of just sort of bringing the government back, a revanchist sort of approach to politics, that's fundamentally different from saying this party wants to do A and we want to do B is different from saying this party wants to do A and we, want, we just want to do not A. And I think once you understand that, I'm not ex- justifying my politics are clearly to the left. And I wrote Grover a nice note with the book. And I said, you know, you probably inspire this book more than anybody else with that quote about how you can govern from the house. Cause it nagged at me for three days, Sam. And I'm like, how can you govern with just the house? That's an absurd claim. And then I thought, well, if your definition of governing, and I'm putting air quotes here, the listeners can't see them. If your definition of governing is to undo things, to stop, to thwart, to dilute, to shrink certain programs, that is governing. And you can do it with just the house. He's absolutely right. And um, the, one of the things, too, that I found interesting about your book was that um, in terms of the important Republican figures as to who have shaped the party that we see today, um, despite the fact that, uh, I mean, I was out there, I think it was in, in 2000. Uh, eight uh, out in New Hampshire, and it, we saw this in 2012 to a certain extent, but certainly uh, in 2008, uh, more people wanted Ronald Reagan than any of their live uh, pre- presidential hopefuls. Uh, and but uh, your argument is that it's not this is not the the Reagan's uh, Republican Party; it's Gingrich's. Yeah, I, I make the argument very clearly in the end that despite the fetishization and the lionization and the naming of National Airport after him, that conservatives' memory of Ronald Reagan is fundamentally different from, first of all, what it was. I mean, he cut taxes in 81, but raised them three times before he got reelected. He raised the payroll tax and the, with the Dole Commission in 86. We could go on and on and on here. And I won't do that. There's a great piece, by the way, about eight or ten years ago by Josh Green in the, the Washington Monthly about how Reagan would be considered a liberal today. And there have been other people who've sort of written this argument that he wouldn't win the nomination if people didn't know what his name was. They just looked at his policies. And I think a lot of people were saying that in 2008 and 2012. But my point is more about the style of politics in Gingrich, and I have a piece out in uh, the American Prospect online uh, yesterday, actually, where I uh, basically argue that if you look back to the contract, it was a series of procedural reforms, you know, no proxy voting, members of Congress have to live by the same rules as people. It wasn't really a laundry list of policies or agendas, or we're going to do more of this or less of this. It was about procedural reform. It was, an, it was an argument to run government by complaining about government, which was pretty novel. I mean, there are reformist politicians who come and say there's things wrong with the government, but that was their platform. And so when we say, well, geez, the Republicans, what is their agenda? What are they trying to do? How come they don't have an agenda? They're just the party of no. That's a nice critique in liberal and democratic circles, but it's not necessarily a critique to conservative ears. They're like, yeah, we're the party of no. That's not a problem. And uh, they've been signaling this since 1993-94 with the contract. And so when people are surprised by the fact that they're perfectly happy to have the least productive Congress in American history, the 113th Congress, the recently completed Congress, that's an accomplishment. Uh, in that, from that philosophical standpoint, that's an accomplishment. And so I think as a warning to fellow liberals, like, be careful, like, what you raise as a criticism, because it's not received in the ears of conservatives as a criticism. It's, it's received as applause in some sense. All right. There's, there's a couple of things here I want to I want to break down. First off, I mean, for 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 those uh, of our audience who are are too young to recall and as disturbing as this is for me, uh, the contract for uh, with America was uh Ostensibly, I mean, it was a nationalization of uh, congressional races, which, I mean, you tell me how precedented that was. But it was also something that sort of came in late, right, in like September, October. I mean, it wasn't something that people were necessarily uh, running on in their home districts, but it was a way to create this sort of nationalization of of the race um, that— um, uh, it was the um, uh, ethically and uh, follically challenged Frank Luntz, who I think uh, came up with that uh, contract for America. But w- I mean, was that the uh, was that the beginning? I mean, I, I mean, how often were things nationalized in that way? 
I mean, I'm not a congressional historian going that far back. We'd have to ask somebody like Julian Zelizer and stuff. And I, I read his books uh, in preparing for this book. I think I, can't, I don't want to say with confidence that there's never he was been on an two days by ago. A party we missed it to do that, right? But I do think, you know, oh, he was. Yeah, he's a great yeah. guy. So I mean, I think I do think it's relatively unprecedented. That I, I don't want to stick my neck out and say no party has ever tried to sort of nationalize congressional elections. But I think no party in the modern era did it, and certainly no party did it as well and as brilliantly. Whatever you think of him personally or his politics or his you know, uh, intellectual uh, rigor or what have you about Newt Gingrich, I mean, it, what he did was, I thought, really, really quite brilliant. And um, uh, to do it in a way by appealing to the Perot voters, which is very clear that they did that, uh, as my political science colleague Ron Rappaport wrote in his book, Three is a Crowd. He's followed the Perot voters now for about 20 years. It was very clear that they were pitching that reform-minded politics. If you remember, Perot was the sort of lift the hood and get up under there, and if we just have balanced budget procedures, you know, everything will solve itself. They were very clearly targeting the Perot voters, which were 19% of the electorate just two years earlier in 1992, and they got a, a significant enough share of them to turn out and vote for the Republicans on this sort of procedural package of promises, and it worked. And I think, you know, that was a very smart politics to sort of say, look, if you're voting for us, vote for us across the board if you want to repudiate, you know, the Clinton administration or the Clinton agenda. And it worked. And by the way, as I mentioned in the book, a a lot of people forget 1992. The Republicans had a bad year, right? Clinton wins the presidency. They're shell-shocked that this Rube governor from Arkansas wins. I think the Democrats picked up a net of four Senate seats, so they had a good Senate cycle. But they lost 10 seats in the House. The Republicans won a net of 10 seats in the 92 elections. And most of that was driven by gerrymandering, which they strategically coordinated with the Congressional Black Caucus to help draw majority-minority districts. So all that stuff we're talking about today, like how the Republicans get fewer votes but still hold the House, that goes back to 1992. Mm. And Gingrich and the other Republicans were behind that movement structurally and procedurally, as well as their agenda that was promoted in the contract with America. Yeah, just to remind people, um, Bill Clinton won that 92 election with something like 45 percent of the vote. And so, I mean, this was not this was not a uh, this was not a, a landslide. Uh, he won. I mean, I, I don't know. You would know better than I. Forty three percent. Yeah. Beca- and, and Forty three percent and about 400 electoral votes or something and, like that. And certainly uh, arguable because Ross Perot was in the race. I don't know. I mean, there's a, I, there's, there's a lot of different data that suggests uh, Perot took as much from Clinton as he did from uh, 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 George uh, Bush. But, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if that's, that's ever going to be resolved. But it, Perot, uh, just to remind our listeners, too, was um, – Rather folksy, and uh, it was very much. I mean, it reminds me of the strain that we saw in uh, people complaining about the Affordable Care Act, like because bills just so large, just the, the the they were offended just by how many pages were in it. Never mind what was uh, specifically in it, and that that sort of strain still runs through our politics. That so, I mean, let me ask you this about that that gerrymandering. Did the Democrats really drop the ball in not realizing that? I mean, I imagine that if the Republicans were doing that in 1990 or following uh, 1990, that it was they they found like, oh, this is actually quite effective. Uh, We should do this again next time around at the next census. Um, Did the Democrats just completely drop the ball on, 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 on seeing what was happening there? I think to a certain degree, and in part is because the Republicans did a 180 within about three or four years. I've got some quotes in the book where Republicans were coming out in the mid-80s saying, you know, race-based gerrymandering should be colorblind. We don't support this. They were completely against the notion of creating majority-minority districts from a philosophical standpoint. And then there was a major Supreme Court ruling, Thornburg versus Gingles in 1986, which basically said, you you know, this can be in a a component of the political calculus in drawing districts and should be. And the Republicans, I think, just thought long and hard on it. And they said, you know what, why are we opposing this? We should support this. And in fact, they gave the software, the party's RNC sophisticated software package, they gave it to the Congressional Black Caucus. 
and they said, let us help you draw these districts. And sure enough, in the 1992 elections, the first elections after, obviously, the census when the numbers are taken in 90 and then, you know, the data comes out in 91. So it's the first cycle. The number of minority legislators increased 117 percent, more than doubled, even though minorities in the country between 1980 and 1990 only increased 17 percent. In fact, that 92 class, Sam, had more black freshman members, freshmen and freshwomen members, uh, than any class prior to 1992 or any class since. It's the largest congressional black caucus freshman class in American history and probably will be forever, given that the black population sort of leveled off around 12 percent nationally. And who helped create that? The RNC. And you could say, well, the CBC sold out and they shouldn't have done that. But it's hard to argue that given their historic underrepresentation, it was a bad move on their part. But it certainly helped stem the tide of what in theory should have been, you know, eight or 10 or 12 net pickups for the Democrats in the House, which if they had done that, that's a 20 point swing. Maybe Gingrich doesn't get over the top in 1994. He probably does anyway. They picked up 54 seats in the 94 Republican Revolution, but they picked up 10 the year before. And of course, they still would have won the Senate. So 94 was coming, I think, either way. But 90 and 92, I spent a lot of time writing about that really set up the Republicans to put themselves in a position to, to, to turn the majority in 94. Right. And it was not only Gingrich, but it was led by Gingrich. All right, Tom, will you walk, we, we walk people through that. I mean, uh, explain to, to, to folks how creating more minority majority districts helped the Republicans long term. Well, it helped them as uh, people didn't really start noticing this until 2010. As you know, a lot of people have been writing about this now. And gerrymandering, to be fair to Republicans, and the advantage that they enjoy is really today, less so 20 years ago, today is twofold. There's a basic geodemographic advantage because Democrats tend to be clustered in urban and inner suburban areas, which is no Republican's fault, of course. And then in 2010, led by Ed Gillespie, there he is again, and the Red Map program, they said, let's strategically win all these governors and state legislatures races in the 2010 midterms. We can use Obamacare and cap and trade to run against the White House. And there's usually a natural sort of pushback against incumbent administrations in midterms. We'll win all these state races and we'll control the maps for, 20, for the 2012 cycle, which is exactly what they did. That is not new. The Republicans in 1990 would have been able to do a lot more damage, except the Democrats were still dominant in the state legislatures in terms of controls of governors and state legislatures, unlike after 1994. If the Republicans had actually been in control of the number of state legislatures and governors back in 1990, the way they were 20 years later in 2010, I mean, the Democrats would have probably gotten wiped out. But the strategic value of gerrymandering with minorities in mind for Republicans is if you create districts that once they get above 60 or 65 percent D, Democratic, then becomes inefficient, right? I mean, you want to win in a, in a system where we have single member districts with plurality rule. You want to win by 55, 60, 65 percent of the vote. But once you start winning races, 80, 90 percent of the vote, in fact, they're so overwhelmingly Democratic districts because they're overwhelmingly minority that Republicans don't even bother to put any money in. They don't even put a challenger in unless somebody puts their name up as lamb to the slaughter. You save all the money from running in that. You concede that seat and you redistribute Republicans elsewhere and you win two other seats. So you lose that seat, but you pick up two more. So it's one step forward and two, st one step back and two steps forward. So that's the strategic insight that Republicans made in the late 80s where they said, let's stop opposing majority minority districting let's support it all right so i just want to make uh you know make sure that people um ha have caught this is that by by essentially corralling um um uh, all these democrats and particularly um uh, minority Democrats in a uh, specific district. That means that the, there's there's less Democrats to go around in the contiguous districts, and um, it's also uh, why the the Republicans will never do outreach because they don't care. <laughs> Those people are not right. in their districts. Well, this is the larger argument of the book. The argument in the book is that you know the Republicans made a lot of perfectly rational choices over the last 25 years in the post-Reagan era that were good for their congressional wing of their party, but bad for the presidential wing of their party. And this is one of the best examples, may be the best example in the book. You create these districts that are very safe Republican districts, but they're largely white districts. That makes perfect, perfectly logical sense, not just in 1990-92 uh, gerrymandering cycle, but even in 2010-2012 cycle. The problem is you have no Republicans who know how to speak to non-white people. And that becomes a problem when people start to do things like Steve Scalise 
or they say these people or what have you. And so your congressional wing starts to really besmirch your party's image because these people think, why are we talking about immigration? This doesn't make any sense. Nobody in my district wants amnesty for these people. I didn't, these people don't vote for me. These don't people don't show up at my cocktail fundraisers. Like they're not even talking to the emerging electorate, you know, to use the contemporary term of minorities and unmarried people and women and single women and, and, and unmarried people and so forth that are driving the growth of the population demographically in the electorate. These people aren't who they're talking to. They're talking to a w- older white male electorate that nominates them in the primary. And once they're nominated, they're going to win the general election. So they're com- when, when you say the Republicans are out of touch, it's, it's quite literally true. They're not in touch with the larger emerging sort of multicultural uh, American electorate. And so it made sense to do it in the short term, but they're paying a long term price. But but the they, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, who is the they there? Because, right, I mean, if the Republican Party is is just like an assemblage uh, or a, uh, a, a um, the, the aggregate of uh, individuals, of elected individuals, for all these individuals, it all makes sense, right? There's like a misalignment of incentives if you are a Republican who wants to have a national appeal versus if you are any other Republican elected official. And maybe arguably there's a couple of there's I don't know, maybe a half a dozen to a dozen who uh, uh, Republican senators who have a little bit of a dilemma. But beyond that. Right. I mean, we're talking about uh, sort of this. There's there's fundamentally different incentives for a Republican congressman, somebody who's uh, willing to stay there, uh, happy to stay there and anybody else who has national aspirations to, uh, as a Republican. That's exactly right. It's a, it's a classic collective action problem. And, and you're right, even though the old saying that inside the heart of every senator beats the, the heart of a future president, most Republican senators have really no designs on running for the White House. And certainly House members outside of Paul Ryan really don't have any designs. And we haven't elected an incumbent House member to the presidency since 1880. So that's not going to happen. So you have about 250 Republicans in the House and the new Congress and you know another uh, 55 in the Senate. That's 300 members of Congress. How am I really going to run for president? Only a handful. So the vast majority of them care more about power in the Senate or the House and their reelection fortunes in their House or Senate districts uh, back home. And that may or may not jibe with the party's national image, which is why you see all of the fights and, and PR snafus with when Stephen Scalise or Todd Akin says forcible raid, because these guys are like, hey, I say forcible rape back home in uh, you know, my county um, you know, party meetings, and nobody bats an eye when I say right, that. that. They know exactly me. what I'm I talking about. I see a about. surge but in my I fundraising. Nationally and I, yeah, right, go ahead. And I have a national firestorm. I'm on every national TV station because I said forcible rape. Why is that a problem, you know? Right. And so, so, so when we, when, I mean, this is the, so, so where does it go from here? I mean, in other words, I mean, and, and Paul Ryan, I guess, has decided that he's not going to run, uh, and um, the— the at least i guess for well at least another uh four to eight years um uh, he's announced uh, today i'm not sure if you heard that um yep. n- no big surprise there i mean because this dynamic as long as this dynamics there it d- does it make it impossible for republican to win a national election or just highly unlikely well i don't think it makes it impossible i think it makes it harder uh, although you, you must recognize that in the last 60 years, only once has a party won three elections in a row, twice if you count it in the popular vote with Gore after two Clinton's, Clinton's two terms. So in theory, if you knew nothing else about the candidates or the economy or who was the, you know, and you just knew that the Rep- Democrats had finished two terms under Obama, the Republicans should be favored to win the White House, given Americans' desire, despite especially conservatives' veneration for the Constitution and its inherent checks and balances. Americans, for whatever reason, like to balance the two chambers or the two institutions, Congress and, pre- and the presidency, against themselves for whatever reason. They think the founders didn't provide sufficient checks. So in theory, the Republicans should be favored. And if I didn't know that Hillary Clinton is in the race, I'd probably say the Republicans are favored. But I do think they have a harder road to sort of win the White House, and not just because you know, the Democrats have their 18 states in D.C., which have 242 electoral votes, which is 90 percent of the way to 270 as a sort of blue wall state that they've won five times in a row. Even putting that aside, I do think the Republicans have a, a bigger problem in terms of national branding and image for a variety of other reasons, some of which I talk about in the book. But I think, and this is the argument in the book, 
is that this has been a, one of the consequences of their congressional domination, that the party has sacrificed its presidential wing, has sacrificed its national agenda, has sacrificed its national brand to a certain degree in order to capture and to keep the Congress. And whether they did that knowingly or the, whether they did that unwittingly, like, say, through you know the gerrymandering example or their lack of a policy agenda or their willingness to sort of be the party of no – they have done it, and the argument of the book is that the party is going to have a, has two choices now. They can uh, execute a full blown recovery where they begin to reach out to Latinos and unmarried women and other parts of the national voting coalition that don't normally vote Republican, or they can continue to retrench and try to win with the d- dwindling white male voter base. And look what they've done, as I point out in the book, Sam. They've turned to states and said, "Let's go to the Maine Nebraska model for electoral votes, where you win them by congressional right. district, or let's uh, you know, or proportional representation, or some people saying, let's get rid of." Pop- your election of senates that's a party that's not trying to expand its reach that's a party that's trying to win as many seats with as few votes as possible i mean that's the thing is that it, it seems to me that they could there is nobody to make the choice to not retrench right because they uh, there there's nobody there's no I, I mean i actually think that we are at the the tipping point for this party where we have as good a chance to see uh, Ted Cruz, you know, because here you had Mitt Romney in 2012, who was uh, the establishment choice, um, and and he had to tack very far to the right, and he's already, I guess, made it clear that he is going to run to the right of uh, of Jeb Bush uh, in 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 2016, assuming he jumps in, you know, which it, what it appears he's going to. But you had uh, Romney, who ran far to the right of who Romney was even eight to 10 months earlier, I think. And mm-hmm. even then he was still, uh, he was still unpalatable, I think to the American public. I think that, you know, we're as likely to see Ted Cruz, uh, or someone from the, that more, I guess, congressionally oriented, uh, uh, Republican party than the sort of na- the, the national, Republican Party. I mean, here's the thing that that, that I want to ask you about right. too. That that seems to be missing is that you you know you talk about the the uh, either by, by plan or not the sort of focus of the Republican Party on their own individual congressional districts, right, and appealing to those districts. What to what extent does the rise of things like not just talk radio but all of these organizations? Because it just seems to me there's so much money now. And when we talk about these uh, competing incentives, uh, we have the incentives of the individual congressperson who now, you know, has a, a, a very narrow elect- uh, electorate to uh, uh, appeal to. But we also have this other rise, it seems to me, of another set of incentives because you've got so much money. <laughs> that is floating around for these organizations and they make they retrench as well right like you know uh uh, uh levin uh, and and hannity and uh limbaugh and the H- heritage foundation they make more money as they go more narrow you know where they follow That's a right. deep as opposed to wide strategy let me make two points. On your first point about Romney, in, in, in Chapter 6 of the book, I start with Romney's Iowa victory, which, again, air quotes because he actually came in second behind by behind Santorum in the Iowa caucuses by like 34 votes. But they basically both came in at 35%. So Romney's got 20, or 25% of the vote in Iowa statewide, right? So that's 25% for Romney. But Santorum plus Bachman plus Gingrich plus Ron Paul, the congressional wing, none of them had been governors, right? They collectively got 64% of the vote. They got five out of every eight votes of Iowa. Now, this is not later when the field is winnowed. This is the Iowa caucuses. Iowa Republicans have a whole year to choose from this, and, they, and, and they've cast 64 out of every 100 votes for Newt Gingrich, who had been out of Congress for 18 years, right? For Rick Santorum, who got slaughtered in his reelection six years early by 17 points in Pennsylvania. Ron Paul, who ran as the Libertarian nominee in 1988 and was never going to go very far given his stances on libertarian issues like marijuana and certainly his you know, sort of isolation of foreign policy. And Michelle Bachman, who's the leader of the House Tea Party Congress. They got 64 votes out of every 100. Romney got 25. So Romney Romney kind of won the Iowa caucus, but really the congressional wing outvoted him two to one. 
that's a very telling barometer of the state of the party in 2012, when the congressional wing is getting two and a half votes for every vote Romney, the establishment former governor, and best funded and best debating candidate gets. Now, on your second point about the parties moving rightward, one of the points I make in the last part of the book is the Republicans' ability to recapture their party from the outside interest, the Sheldon Adelsons, is getting harder and harder thanks to their own conservative court's rulings, right? Citizens United and McCutcheon is giving more power to non-party elites, right? Wealthy business people who can now give unlimited sums because of McCutcheon to a certain limit, $3 million in federal hard money. And of course, you know, corporations and yes, unions in, in the Citizens United ruling two years earlier in 2010. Now, one of the things I talk about in the book is when the two parties move toward the money, that means moving toward the right. You know, if your both parties are uh, being attracted by Goldman Sachs money, whether it's Robert Rubin in the Clinton administration or, um, um, I'm blocking on the same, Hank Paulson, the also Goldman chairman in the Bush administration. When the two parties move right, the one advantage for the Democrats is when the Republicans move right, they move farther right. And when the Democrats move right, that means they move center by definition. And whatever you think about the DLC and Clinton and Gore, and I'm a liberal, I'm not a big fan of a lot of what they did. The fact of the matter is when the two parties move right, one is moving toward the center and one is moving to the far right fringe. And the growth of, uh, uh, of outside money is ultimately not going to help the Republican Party in my view. Right, but I, I'm not even talking about electoral money. I'm just saying that there is a huge industry that is fomenting the narrowness of the politics. That you know that that they're not even putting that money necessarily into electoral politics, but there's just this like huge cottage industry that is out there and basically telling uh, you know the. Really, I mean, there's really no other way to describe it. The Republican primary voter <laughs> that, right. um, that you know, Boehner's selling you out. Uh, they, the fact that they haven't gone forward with this lawsuit is criminal, uh, according to them. Uh, you know, this is, the, this is what, like, uh, the Laura Ingrams and the Mark Levins are doing. Uh, and, and even, like, the Heritage Foundation, they make their money by stoking this type of stuff in a way that that force never existed. I mean, it's one thing, Adelson obviously extended the campaign significantly for Gingrich, but, you know, Gingrich is getting into that race because what has he got to lose? Like, there's so much cash for him to make, just as an individual, right? Uh, and, and that extended his sort of public intellectual career, if you want to call it that, for, I don't know, another half dozen years, uh, just based upon the emails he's collected. And that is adding something. It's, it's, it's adding to that retrenchment, it seems to me. Well, I mean, there's that famous quote I'm sure you've heard about how Buchanan, uh, you know, Pat Buchanan said, you know, uh, uh, you know, politics starts as a movement, becomes a business, and eventually degenerates into a racket or something to that effect. And there are certainly people whose professional business is is racket politics, right? Is to sort of prey on, and it happens on the left too. Let's be fair, right? They prey on sort of the hopes and wishes of people who are on the extremes of the party, and they sell that as a commodity mm -hmm. and get donations and you know win favor with and have access to powerful politicians and so forth. And they're in the business of politics for the business of politics, not really for necessarily moving a full on policy or whatever, just for their own self-empowerment. I mean, you can see that, for example, in the gun industry, which, um, you know, is about gun rights for people, but is really defending, you know, ammunition and, and, and gun makers, because if they really cared about limiting guns and listen to conservatives, they would be trying to get the federal government to buy fewer guns, which conservatives are always complaining about, but they want the federal government to buy a lot of guns and bullets, too, as we've learned, right? Their business is to sell guns. They don't really care about the politics insofar as an end in itself. It's a means to another end. And I do think there's a racket-style politics that eventually develops when movements become co-opted uh, to a certain degree. And we saw that in the Tea Party, right? Gets bought out by the Koch brothers. And, and that is a problem because, as you point out, first of all, it moves the politics in a very aggressive way toward the polls, usually, left for liberals and right for Republicans uh, and, and, uh, and conservatives. But it also uh, it takes the power away from the party. And I think the parties are getting less and less powerful, in part because of Supreme Court rulings and in part because of entrepreneurial politics of very well. Right. The individuals, and I have a quote at the end of the book from an expert on, um, on on campaign finance, Ray LaRaja, a political science colleague of mine. He says, "What we've learned is that when parties are regulated 
with campaign finance and individuals are regulated. Individuals aren't really regulated. The only parties get regulated in these reforms. And so the parties are getting weaker and weaker at a time when the Republicans keep saying we need to take control of our party. And that's going to be a problem for them. That's right. And I would I would also argue this, that even though you can look at uh, the, the money flowing into these electoral politics, the, the dollar amounts may more or less be equivalent on both sides. But the, the amount of money in that racket politics on the right, and I'm saying this as someone who is, it you know, arguably in some form of that entrepreneurial uh, politics on the left, is much larger on the right. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it is by a factor of, I don't know what, but it's huge. It's huge. Right. And, and, and who's running it? Like, okay, what's interesting to me is Ed Gillespie, a fascinating guy, right? He becomes Virginia State Party Chair. He eventually becomes National Party Chair. Then he drops back and he becomes the state legislative party chair. In other words, the person whose job it is to elect state legislators. It'd be like a U.S. Uh, a, a president deciding to run for his state legislative seat, like in some Gene Hackman movie on TV, right? right? Like it doesn't make any sense until you realize, okay, there's a lot of power there if you control the governors and the state legislatures. And how is he doing it? He's doing with Crossroads GPA, him and Carl Rowe. Now, who's more powerful in Republican politics? Is it Rents Priebus, the putative? leader of the party, the titular leader? No, it's not. It's the former party chair and the former sort of, you know, a political advisor to President Bush, Karl Rove. It's Gillespie and Bush. They're really running the party outside of the party, which is, is an epiphenomena that is not just there, happening there. You could argue that Terry McCullough for a while was, was sort of doing it after he became party chair and then he ran for governor of Virginia. But either way, like the parties, I think, are losing control of the reins of their own message and apparatus and financing. And it's not just a Republican problem, of course. It's Democratic problem, but I think because there's so much more money, as you point out, on the right, and so much more money in Republican politics, though not that much more anymore, um, it, it creates a larger problem, or at least that's what I argue in the book. It's going gonna, it's gonna to create a problem for both parties, but an asymmetrically larger problem for the Republicans, in my view. I could, could be proved wrong. We'll see. Thomas Schaller, uh, the book is The Stronghold, How Republicans Captured Congress but Surrendered the White House. Uh, if uh, Particularly uh, those uh, uh, who did not live through it or were not adults, uh, over the past 25 years, if you want to get a real sense of what's been going on in our politics over the past 25 years, this um, this is a great place to start. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Sam. 